So this is the chapter six of the archaeological writings of the Sanhedrin and Talmuds of the Jews, uh, translated in 1913 and found in the Library of Vatican. So let's read the report of Caiaphas to the Sanhedrin concerning the execution of Jesus. These are records of the Jerusalem Sanhedrin by Eliezer Hiran, taken in Constantinople, October the 16, 1883. Caiaphas, Prince of the Most High God, to the Masters of Israel, greeting. In obedience to your demands for a reason for my action in the case of Jesus of Nazareth and in defense of my conduct, I beg leave to submit the following for your consideration. I would assure you that it was not on account of personal malice, envy, or hate that existed in my own nature, nor for the want of a willingness upon my part to conform to the Jewish law in its strictest sense. I had but very little personal knowledge of the Nazarene. The most I knew of this man was from outside sources. Nor was it because he claimed to be king of the Jews, nor because he said he was the son of God. I would that he were, nor because he prophesied or ignored the holy temple. No, nor all of this combined. There is a cause and a more weighty matter back of all these things that controlled my action in the matter. Therefore, I hope you will investigate strictly on legal principles the reasons that I may give. In order that you may be able to see and weigh the question fully, and remember the responsibility that rests upon me according to the laws of our nation, I will ask you to go back with me to the chronicles of our history as a commonwealth. First, our faith is pledged to one living and true God, this God being indescribable, unchangeable, incomprehensible, and of course, unnameable. But yet, in our daily communications with and our applications to him, he has been pleased to give us his name or his several names according to his relations to us, and they are found nowhere, only in the ark of his holy temple, there where he presents to us his strength and power. He calls himself Eloi, which means almighty in strength, that he does the greatest thing as easy as he does the least. This makes him different from all beings. In his holy ark, he records himself Ila, existence without a beginning, and no contingency as to his end. Again, he writes himself, Helegion, unchangeable, that is, nothing but his own will can change him. Again, he records his name, Jah, knowledge that comprehends without being comprehended. Again, he is written Adonai, full and free and freely full. Combining the several names, we have Jehovah the Hebrew God. A man never can go wrong while he can pronounce this name in its comprehensive sense. This is where the zealots, the Sadducees, and the sins had their origin, and it is the want of being able to pronounce this name in its comprehensive sense that causes so much dissension among us Jews. Jesus could pronounce this name, but he stole it out of the temple, as I am creditable in form. But the object in calling your attention to pronouncing this name with all its bearings may be seen if we turn to the third book of Leviticus, section 10, wherein is the special order made by our God to Moses that we should offer the bullock, the ram, the flour and oil, and the people should fast seven days, and this should be kafar, or atonement, for the sins of all people. Now, unless Moses was deceived, he has deceived us, or Jesus of Nazareth is a false teacher. For all he teaches is metanoite, metanoite, as though a man's being sorry for a crime would make restitution to the offended party. A man might repent ever so much, but what good would that do towards healing the man he had injured? None in the least. This mode of making atonement was ordained by God and revealed to Moses, but if man has nothing to do but to repent, the disease carries its own remedy with it. So a man can sin as often as he may wish to. Look at the first book, section 3. 
And God said to Abraham by his own mouth that each and all that were circumcised by the cutting of the prepuce should be saved. This should be the seal of the covenant. Now, if this is not true, God must go against his own contract, violate his own promises, as well as deceive the faith and cheat the obedience of his own children. This is also if Jesus' teaching be true, for he sets up table, baptism, as the seal of God. I refer you to section 10, division 1, where God said to Moses that he had changed the laws, converted the elements for the protection of his people, and with his own arm had delivered them out of a strong combat, and that they might remember, and that the generation to be born might remember and never forget to trust in him when in danger. He said that once every year we should roast a kid or lamb and eat it with unleavened bread, and this should be the sign that we would trust in him in all times of danger. Now Jesus teaches that common bread and wine are to be used instead thereof, a thing unheard of. And not only so, something that is altogether repugnant to God and something that fosters drunkenness and is well qualified to excite men's passions. And all oh, ye masters of Israel, a thing once. Jesus calls himself the Son of God claims to have been born of Alma, the Hebrew word for virgin, that he and his father are one, they are equal. These things will establish the following conclusions. If he is right, his father is false. If they were one, then their teaching would be one. And if his teachings are true, God's must be wrong, or there are not those perfections in him that we learn in pronouncing his holy name. By tolerating the teachings of Jesus, we say to the Romans that all of our former teachings are false, that the Hebrew's God is not to be trusted, that he is weak, wanting in forethought, that he is vacillating and not to be trusted, much less to be honored and obeyed. Thus, the world will lose confidence in our God and confidence in us as a religious people. This is impregnating the whole atmosphere with moral pollution. It does not only cut off, but blocks the way of all Jews from heaven. And not only this, it excludes our hope in the salvation of our forefathers, who have obeyed God in his ordinances, believed in his promises, and shouted in the triumphs of a holy life for 1400 years. He entirely ignores God's holy temple, the house God has built by our forefathers under his own supervision, where he promised to dwell with his children, to hear their prayers, and to be pleased with their sacrifices. This temple is the bond of the Jews. Here all men can come and be blessed. It is the earthly home of the souls of men, the place where men may hide from the storms of sin and persecution. This temple is where the foolish may learn wisdom, the place where the naked soul can be clothed, and where the hungry may be fed. This the grandest gift of our Father. Jesus completely ignores this temple, says the priests have made it a den of thieves, and sets up a sneer and even scoffs at its sacred ordinances, and with a sort of selfish triumph says it shall be destroyed. And from his manner of saying it, I have no doubt he would be glad to see it quickly done. But what would be the condition of our people if this temple was removed? What would be the use of the priesthood if the temple was destroyed? Where would we find an answer by Urim and Tumim? How would the soul of man be purified if the holy bath call, the Uruk of God, should depart? There, in that sacred temple of God, he has been burning to the consuming of sin and the purifying of the heart since our return from bondage in Babylon. My argument is, if this temple is destroyed or even forsaken by the Jews, we as nation are utterly ruined. We might as well put our necks under the feet of idolatry and give up all hope. One more subject I place before my masters of Israel. Is it compatible with our religion, or is it consistent with philosophy, or admitted in his holy word that there can be more gods than one? When we pronounce Ilela, Shaddai, Yelon, Adonai, which is Jehovah, there can be but one living God. By reference to section 6, number 4, he says by mouth of Moses when he was all aglow with the glory of God, 
And remember, he speaks either by mouth or quail. It is he that speaks and not man. He says, the Lord your God is one God. There can be but one. I am and have been with you. I brought you up. I delivered you out of a strong compact. I delivered you out of their hand and kept you dry while your enemies were drowned in the sea. I will not forsake you. I promised your father I would not. But if you forsake me, then desolation will come upon you and have you in swift destruction. In section 5, 3 and 4 of David's Song of Joy, I am God alone. If I turn to the right or to the left, if I go down into the depths of the sea or into the center of the earth or over the heavens, I should find no companion. In section 3 he says, I am God alone, and alone I am God. Beside me there is no help for man nor angels. Then in section 13, this command has been given. Thou shalt pay to the Lord thy God once a year a half shekel of silver, that thou and thy children and all the strangers that are within thy gate may know that there is no God beside me on whom they may call in time of danger. Now, having all these commands and teachings from the very lips of God himself before my eyes and being held responsible for the soundness of our doctrine and the proper inculcation of the same among the people of the Jews, what was I to do? Could I stand as a priest of the Most High God and see your blessed religion perverted by an impostor? Could I stand and see the holy temple of our God deserted and forsaken? Could I stand and see all the holy ordinances which had been appointed by our God for securing salvation to Israel perverted by an impostor? All the blessed doctrines that were appointed for the government and instruction of the priesthood thence to be imparted to the youth of our land set aside, and that by one that could show no authority, only the authority of John the Baptist, who could give no authority, only the one who sent him to baptize, and he could not tell who he was nor whence he came. Hence, you can see the responsible position that I as a high priest of God and of the Jewish church occupied. According to our laws, I was made responsible and stood between my God and my people to protect them in doctrine and government. I refer you to the capitulation made by the Sanhedrin and Augustus Caesar in the holy Tosefta of the Talmuds. We submitted taxation by the Romans, and the Romans are to protect our holy religion from foreign foes in order that the holy temple or any of its sacred ordinances should never be molested, nor the holy city Jerusalem be polluted by Roman idolatry. Now, the insinuating plan adopted by Jesus was well qualified to deceive the common people. It had already led many to forsake the temple and hold her ordinances in derision, as well as to neglect the teachings of the priests or to pay the tithes for their supplies. He had already inculcated into the Jewish mind his pernicious ways of being saved to that extent that the Jewish cause was almost lost. There are two reasons for this. First, the people to whom he preached were an ignorant set and knew but very little about doctrine of any kind. They are a restless sort of men who are always finding fault and wanting something new and never associate with a more enlightened part of the community in order to learn. Another reason of his having many followers is his doctrines are congenial to unsanctified flesh. They are so suited to human nature that they require no sacrifices. They need not go to the temple to worship God. They need not fast, and they can when and where they please. They need pay no tithes to keep up the temple or the priesthood, but every man can be his own priest and worship God as he chooses. All this is so compatible with human nature that although he has not been preaching over three years, he has more followers today than Abraham has, and they have become perfectly hostile towards the Jews that are faithful to their God. And if it had not been for the Roman soldiers, on the day of his execution we would have had one of the bloodiest insurrections ever known to the Jewish commonwealth. I am told that there was never seen such a concourse of people assembled at Jerusalem as at the cross. One of my guards informed me that there were several hundred thousand 
And although there were two other crucified at the same time, Jesus was the great center of attraction. They would call out, who is this Jesus of Nazareth? What is his crime? Some of his friends would cry out, nothing. He's being executed because he was a friend to the poor. Take him down, take him down, they would cry out, and the soldiers would have to use their spears to keep them back. But when he yielded up the ghost, he proved to all that he was hypostatical, that is, a human body, and the Lodi Curious had come from the Icelandic covenant, and his Trinitatis Unitas was all a shame. For how could this unpronounced name suffer or be captured by man or die, unless he is the one that is to die for the many? And if so, I was only accomplishing God's holy purposes, which exonerates me from guilt. But it seemed to me a necessity that he should be removed. That this may be evident to your minds, I ask you to contrast our present condition with the past. Jesus of Nazareth spent two years in Egypt under the instruction of Rabbi Joshua and learned the art of tomaturgy to perfection, as has never been taught in any of the schools of necromancy among the heathen. If the healing miracles of Jesus are true, as they must be, for they are so acknowledged by his foes as well as his friends, he must have learned it from Horus and Serapis, as practiced by those heathen priests. He came back to Palestine as a physician and was by nature an enthusiast, as well as a Hebrew patriarch. And when John's preaching excited idealistic minds, Jesus also went to that teacher and was inspired by him to inculcate and promulgate his doctrines. Notwithstanding his youth and inexperience, Jesus started out as a public orator and teacher with the doctrines of John, and in that capacity referred exclusively to his authority as every public teacher in these days has to be ordained by some acknowledged authority. As long as John was at large, Jesus, in the capacity of an itinerant teacher and physician, roused the people of Galilee to metanoia, repentance of sin, to bring about the restoration of the kingdom of heaven. He met with the same opposition that John did from those who would not admit that they were more sinful than their progenitors were, or that ascetism was the proper means for the restoration of the kingdom of heaven. But he met with the same success among the lower classes, such as foreign harlots, sodomites, publicans, and other Roman agents, but the intelligent portion remained cold and unmoved by his enthusiasm. The cures which he performed appeared miraculous to his followers, but most ridiculous to the intelligent Jews and men of sober and reflective mind. Jesus embraced the humanitarian doctrine of the Hillelites, presenting conspicuously the cosmopolitan spirit of Judaism, and he did it almost in the words of Hillel, who had taught it before. Their faith and doctrine being alike, it was not hard for him to create excitement or to find plenty of followers. In addition to all this, he taught a system of low morals and so void of all ritualistic ideas that it was easy for him to get any number of followers. He taught the people that there was but one living and true God, but he taught them that he was that God and that his father was merged into himself and could not manifest himself only through him, which theory would confute itself if they would only stop to reflect, for as he was hypostatical or corporeal, his assistance was cut off from all that was not immediately in his presence, which is altogether incompatible with the faith of the Jews. Right in the face of this doctrine, he would teach that there was a special providence as well as a general providence, as if there could be a general providence without a God that could be present in all places at all times, as we learn in pronouncing his name. He taught that the dead will rise and live again in a future state of happiness or misery according as they have lived here. Therefore, he taught future rewards and punishments. But he being present, how could he reward in the future? He taught the revelation and the prophets, but contradicted all they teach. He taught the election of Israel by the Almighty, but ignored all the doctrines of Israel. He taught the eternity of God's laws and promises in the super-importance of the humanitarian over the ritual laws and doctrines, 
but I do not think he wished to abolish the latter or even the traditional laws, but merely to supersede them by a higher life. The natural result of all this was that he disregarded the laws of Levitical cleanness, which were considered so important by the Shamites and Essenes, and also by the Hillelites. This is the point where division commenced, and the bridge grew wider and wider until an insurrection must have been the result. He so far cut himself loose from the Jews that he ate with unclean sinners, publicans, and lepers and permitted harlots to touch him, while his disciples went so far as to eat their meals without washing themselves. Furthermore, he looked upon the whole of the Levitical institutions, temples, sacrifices, and priesthood included as no longer necessary and not worth the life of an animal. This was certainly the opinion of the Hillelites. Jesus, it seems, found in this Hillelite school a party furnished to hand ready to take up with his heresy, and a large party they are almost sufficient to divide the whole Jewish commonwealth. They taught the repentance of sin, the practice of benevolence and charity, the education of the young and goodwill towards mankind, as possessing much more moral worth than all the Levitical cleanness or compliance with the whole moral law given to us by our God to govern us. His preaching was of the parabolical style. He would rely on a text of scripture, for he seemed to hold the scriptures in high veneration. So his preaching was on the Midrash style of the scribes, a maxim expressed in the style of Saul or of Shirak's son. His great object was to come as near the Jewish theology as possible, so as to destroy the Jews entirely and establish his own. Hence, he resorted to the allegorical method of the Egyptians, Hebrews, uttering many good and wise sayings, which were not new to the learned, but which were taken from the common wisdom of the country, which was known by all who were acquainted with the literature of the rabbis. But they were new to his class of hearers, who were not accustomed to listen to the wise. He had no education, comparatively speaking. He was full of nervous excitement, all of which went to inspire his hearers with enthusiasm. He took but little care of his health or person, cared not for his own relatives. He traveled mostly on foot in the company of his disciples and some suspicious women, and lived on the charity of his friends. He seemed to take no notice of the political affairs of his country, would as soon be governed by one nation as another. In fact, it seems if he had any preference, it was for the Romans. It seems that he became so infatuated that he really thought he was the head of the kingdom of heaven. This manner of preaching, along with his presumption, aroused his enemies to a powerful pitch, and it was all I could do to keep the zealots from mobbing him in the temple. They had no confidence in a doctrine that set the Jewish laws at naught and mocked the priesthood of God, and they, with the Sadducees and scribes, were not willing to submit to a man who acknowledged no authority higher than himself and was seemingly endeavoring to overturn everything that they held more sacred and dearer than life. Jesus' mode and manner were well qualified to deceive the unsuspecting. Let us have all things in common, said he, and he that would be the greatest among you will prove his greatness by rendering the greatest service to all. And if any of the higher powers compel thee to go a mile, let him that is compelled go ten miles. This caused him to be attacked more in his policy than in his doctrine. The great question with us Jews was, here are the Romans upon us. How can we get rid of them? Jesus' idea was to let the Romans alone. It matters not who rules and governs the nations. If they abuse you, love them in return, and they cannot be your enemies long. No man can continue to abuse another who returns injury with love. Keep from them. Pray in secret for the return of the kingdom of heaven and God's grace, and this will soon make all things right. Pay your taxes, he would say to them. It is only Caesar's money you pay which is unlawful for you to have unlawful on account of its idolatrous effigies. Again, he would say to his hearers, you cannot conquer the Romans, better convert to them, and they are your enemies no longer. They already have your temple in their possession. 
their yoke is getting heavier every day, and the more you fight against them, the more they will abuse you. Therefore, your only chance is to love them and try to make your yoke easy and your burden light by having them your friends. Indeed, the conduct of Jesus was so strange and incompatible with the interest of the Jews as a nation that it seemed to me that he was a subject employed by the Romans to keep the Jews submissive and obedient to all their tyranny and abuse. This policy was most powerfully attacked by the Shemites and Zealots, and in fact the whole Jewish nation was becoming aroused to a war hit. The reprimands of Jesus were so severe against the rich and highly educated that they had turned against him and brought all the power they had, both of their wealth and talent, so that I saw that a blood insurrection was brewing fast. The public mind of the Jews was becoming more and more divided and corrupt. Heretical doctrines were being diffused all over the land. The temple was forsaken and the holy sacraments neglected. The people were dividing into sects, and the breaches were like a rent in a garment, tearing wider apart continually. As it seemed to me, the whole of the Jewish theocracy was about to be blown away as a bubble on a breaker. As the Jews became more and more divided and confused, the tyranny of the Romans increased. All they wanted was an excuse to slaughter the Jews and confiscate their property. At this time, both the doctrine and the religion of the Jews were spreading rapidly all over Rome, which gave the Romans great alarm. See, Jane undertook to have an ordinance passed in the Senate abolishing the Jewish religion from Rome. And when he found it would cause an insurrection, they banished all the Jews from Rome, and back they came to Judea with all their idolatry and heresy, and many other corrupt principles from the Romans, which fitted them to join any party for profit. Up to this time, the Roman governors had shown great kindness to the Jews. There never was a better man than Hyarchan. The Jews enjoyed great peace during his administration. But Tiberius has turned against us. Pilate has removed the army from Caesarea to Jerusalem. I say no nation with any self-respect or one that had any energy left would or could stand it without a struggle. Now the preaching of John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth had brought all these things upon us. When Herod Antipas captured John, it quieted matters in Galilee so that they had peace until Jesus started up afresh. I had issued orders to Jesus to desist from preaching unless he taught as the Jews taught. He sent me the impertinent word that his doctrine was not of this world, but had reference to the world to come. When he was all the time doing all he could to destroy the peace and harmony of this world. Now, according to our law in the Safra by Joseph B. Talmud, it devolves on me to see that the people have sound doctrine taught them. Hence, it is my duty to examine all the mitrashim, or sermons of all the preaching priests, and if anyone teach the people wrongly, or if his conduct is not in correspondence with his profession, to cause him to desist, or if any disregard the holy laws of oblation, or in any way defile himself, or if he shall be guilty of misconduct in any way, either in the manner of life or doctrine, to adjudge such an one, and pronounced sentence for his crime upon him. This I did upon Jesus of Nazareth to save the church from heresy and to save the cause of the Jewish commonwealth from final ruin. But I understand that I did not act rashly nor illegally as I am accused. I only passed sentence under the protest and order of the whole court belonging to the high priest containing twelve members or elders and priests. Thus, you will see it was not my voluntary act, but was a legal one and in accordance with law. After I examined Jesus on the various charges, he said in the presence of all the court that each and all of them were true. I then reasoned with him and asked him if the court of the high priest would forgive him of these charges, would he desist from these things in all time to come? He answered most empathically and positively, he would not. Under these circumstances, I was compelled, according to our law, to sentence him to die. 
For if he continued to promulgate his pernicious heresies, the Jews as a nation must perish with their religion. And as you find in Tosepta that the nation has always a right of self-preservation, and as we had conceded the right to the Romans of executing our criminal laws, it became my painful duty to send him to Pontius Pilate with the following charges. Caiaphas, high priest of the Most High God, to Pontius Pilate, governor of the Roman province. Jesus of Nazareth is thus charged by the high court of the Jews, first with teaching the doctrine that there are more gods than one, which is contrary to the teachings of the Jewish law, which he most positively refuses to desist from in the presence of this court. Second, he teaches that he is a god, which is contrary to the Jewish law, and he is visible and comprehensible. And after being asked to desist by this court, he most positively affirms that he is the Son of God. Third, he teaches and affirms that the bad quality, holy spirit, cannot come until he goes away, which is contrary to the teachings of the Jews, because it was he that brooded over the waters and has been in the habitual light of the world ever since, from all of which he refuses to desist. He teaches baptism as the seal of God instead of circumcision, which was established by the decrees of God with Abraham as a seal of the Jews, and when abjured to desist by this court, declared he would not. He teaches ascetism as the means of salvation, contrary to the Jewish custom, and affirmed in the presence of this court he would not desist. He teaches that the Levitical ablution is of no service, while we hold that the outward washing is the sign of inward purity, and when abjured to desist, he empathically refused. He has abrogated the ordinance given by God to Moses of the Paschal Supper, wherein we should roast the lamb and eat it with unleavened bread. But Jesus has introduced a custom altogether different, without any authority. He has introduced common bread and wine, which are not only forbidden, but are well qualified to excite men's passions and make them forget God rather than to remember and trust Him. This feast having been introduced that we should remember to trust Him in the hours of trouble. When asked why He did this, all He would say was, Hitherto I work and my Father works. He has abrogated the priesthood and set the temple at naught, which is the very life's blood of the Jewish faith. Were it not that God our Father has given us these holy ordinances, we would not be so tenacious of them. We know they are the pillars upon which the Jewish theocracy is built, and that we cannot live without them. Although Jesus of Nazareth has been abjured time and again to stop teaching these ways of death, he has as often declared he would not. Therefore, it devolves on me as the proper and the only officer to pronounce sentence upon him. These charges were written by my scribe and sent with the officers to Pilate for his consent. Of course, I did not expect him to execute him as he did, but it seems that the mob was so great that Pilate never received them. I expected Pilate to send Jesus back to me so that I could send him to you for your approval. And if so, then I would proceed to try him with Urim and Tumim, with the regular lactis on guard, as our law requires. But it seems that Pilate thirsted for his blood. Like all guilty tyrants, he was afraid of his own shadow and wished to destroy everything that threatened his power. With these reasons for my actions, I submit the case which I am sure will be considered favorably by my masters of Israel. And now we have from the same volume, the archaeological writings of the Sanhedrin and Talmuds of the Jews, 1913 translation, we have a second report of Caiaphas to the Sanhedrin concerning the resurrection of Jesus. And this is uh, the comments of the authors. After having made the preceding record of Caiaphas, and unwinding the same scroll, we found another report from him. It may be interesting to the reader to know what we mean by a scroll. It is similar to a parchment. 
The Hebrew word numet means a pulp made from the bark of the reed into a past and dried in the sun until it is hard. When pressed and polished, it shines beautifully, and its surface is as smooth as our paper. It is of two kinds. One is called papyrus, and the other one, hierotike. The latter is most costly, and is used by priests alone. It is about 16 inches wide, and is cemented together by a gum that exudes from a tree resembling our elm. It is written upon with some kind of indelible ink or paint with a common reed quill, which is fashioned like our pens. The writing is done by the sofer, which is the Hebrew word for scribe. He is called Grammateus by the Greeks. The report of Caiaphas is written in what is known as the square Hebrew. The letters are from a half inch to an inch in size, so that one can imagine what a roll of parchment it would take to record the deed. It is read only with difficulty by the best Hebrew scholars, and they must have textbooks to assist them. But after one has gotten the thread of the subject, he can get along with it. This is the reason I got Dr. McIntosh to go with me. He and Dr. Twyman have been in the business for many years. The windlass, as it might be called, for it resembles our common rope winders than anything I can think of, is a square piece of timber about three inches in diameter to which the scroll is fastened at one end around which it is rolled like a spool. At the proper distance are tied two transverse sticks to hold the parchment to its proper place. The windlass with a scroll is placed at one end of a table and an empty windlass at the other end so that as you unwind from the one to read, the scroll winds around the other. The letters are very distinct. There are hundreds of these arranged in rows. They are all lettered and numbered with their dates on them. This makes it easy to find anything desired. There is another class of books of fine sheep or goat skin, about 8 by 12 inches. The writing on this is very fine and difficult to read. They are bound between cedar boards with clasps and contain from 8 to 40 sheets to the book. These are the kind of books of which Josephus wrote 72. But to return to Caiaphas report, after unwinding several feet as before stated, we came across another communication from Caiaphas. I hardly know whether to call it a resignation or a confession. One thing I do know, it is one of the most solemn things that I ever read. We thanked God that we had come to Constantinople and that Mohammed had given orders to preserve these sacred scrolls in the mosque of Santa Sophia. It is as follows. Sanhedrin 89 by Sipri 2, 7. To you, masters of Israel, as I have made a formal defense to you, and you have approved the same, I feel in duty bound to communicate to you some facts that have come to my knowledge since that communication. A few days after the execution of Jesus of Nazareth, the report of his resurrection from the dead became so common that I found it necessary to investigate it, because the excitement was more intense than before and my own life as well as that of Pilate was in danger. I sent for Malchus, the captain of the royal city guard, who informed me he knew nothing personally, as he had placed Isham in command of the guard. But from what he could learn from the soldiers, the scene was awe-inspiring, and the report was so generally believed that it was useless to deny it. He thought my only chance was to suppress it among the soldiers and have John and Peter banished to Crete or arrested and imprisoned, and if they would not be quiet, to treat them as I had treated Jesus. He said that all the soldiers he had conversed with were convinced that Jesus was resurrected by a supernatural power and was still living, and that he was no human being, for the light and the angels and the dead that came out of their graves all went to prove that something had happened that never occurred on earth before. He said that John and Peter were spreading it all over the country and that if Jesus would appear at the head of a host and declare for the king of the Jews, he believed all the Jews would fight for him. I sent for the left hand who gave a lengthy account of the occurrence that morning, all of which I suppose you have learned and will investigate. 
From this, I am convinced that something transcending the laws of nature took place that morning that cannot be accounted for upon natural laws, and I find it is useless to try to get any of the soldiers to deny it, for they are so excited that they cannot be reasoned with. I regret that I had the soldiers placed at a tomb for the very things that they were to prevent they have helped to establish. After questioning the soldiers and officers to my satisfaction, my mind being so disturbed that I could neither eat nor sleep, I sent for John and Peter. They came and brought Mary and Joanna, who are the women that went to embalm Jesus' body the morning of the resurrection, as it is called. They were very interesting as they related the circumstances. Mary says that when they went, days were just breaking. They met the soldiers returning from the sepulchre and saw nothing strange until they came to the tomb and found that it was empty. The stone that covered the sepulchre was rolled to one side and two men dressed in flowing white were sitting, one at each end of the sepulchre. Mary asked them where was her Lord. They said, he is risen from the dead. Did he not tell you he would rise the third day and show himself to the people to prove that he was the Lord of life? Go tell his disciples, said they. Jonah said she saw but one man, but this discrepancy must have been due to their excitement, because they say they were much alarmed. They both say that as they returned, they met the master who told them that he was the resurrection and the life. All that we accept shall be resurrected from the second death. We fell at his feet and bathed in tears, and when we rose up, he was gone. Both these women wept for joy while relating these circumstances, and John shouted aloud, which made me tremble in every limb, for I could not help thinking that something that was the exclusive work of God had occurred. But what it all meant was a great mystery to me. It might be, I said, that God had sent this message by the mouth of this stranger. It might be that he was the seed of the woman, and we, his people, had executed him. I asked John and Peter if they could give me any further evidence in regard to this man, that I wished to be informed of his private history. Peter said that Jesus passed by where he was and bade him follow him, and he felt attracted to him, but at first it was more through curiosity than anything in the man, that he soon became acquainted with Mary, who told him that he was her son, and related to him the strange circumstances of his birth, and that she was convinced that he was to be the king of the Jews. She spoke of many strange things concerning his life, which made Peter feel more interested in him than he would have been otherwise. He said that Jesus was a man so pleasant in his character and so like a child in innocence that no one could help liking him after he got acquainted with him. That though he seemed to be stern and cold, he was not so in reality. That he was exceedingly kind, especially to the poor. That he would make any sacrifice for the sick and needy and would spare no effort to impart knowledge to anyone that would call on him and that his knowledge was so profound that he had seen him interrogated by the most learned doctors of the law, and he always gave the most perfect satisfaction, and that the sophers or scribes and the Hillelites and the Shamites were afraid to open their mouths in his presence. They had attacked him so often and been repelled that they shunned him as they would a wolf. But when he had repelled them, he did not enjoy the triumph as they did over others of whom they had gotten the ascendancy. As to his private life, he seemed not to be a man of pleasure nor of sorrow. He mingled with society to benefit it, and yet took no part at all in what was going on. I had heard many tell of what occurred when he was baptized, and from what his mother told me, I was watching for a display of his divine power, if he had any for I knew he could never be the king of the Jews unless he did have help from on high. Once when we were attending a marriage feast, the wine gave out and his mother told him of it, and he said to the men to fill up some water pots that were sitting near, and they put in nothing but water, for I watched them, but when they poured it out, it was wine. 
for it was tasted by all at the feast. And when the master found it out, he called for Jesus to honor him, but he had disappeared. It seemed that he did not want to be popular, and this spirit displeased us, for we knew if he was to be the king of the Jews, he must become popular with the Jews. His behavior angered his mother, for she was doing all she could to bring him into notice and to make him popular among the people, and the people could not help liking him when they saw him. Another peculiarity was that in his presence, everyone felt safe. There seemed to be an almighty power pervading the air wherever he went, so that everyone felt secure and believed that no harm could befall them if Jesus was present. As we were in our fishing boat, I saw Jesus coming out toward us, walking on the water. I knew that if he could make the waves support him, he could me also. I asked him if I might come to him. He said to me to come, but when I saw the waves gathering around me, I began to sink and ask him to help me. He lifted me up and told me to have faith in God. On another occasion, we were sailing on the sea and there was a great storm. It blew at a fearful rate, and all on board thought they would be lost. We awakened the master, and when he saw the raging of the storm, he stretched out his hand and said, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased to blow, the thunder stopped, the lightnings withdrew, and the billowing sea seemed as quiet as a babe in its mother's arms. All done in one moment of time. This I saw with my own eyes, and from that time I was convinced that he was not a common man. Neither did he work by enchantment like the Egyptian taumaturgists, for in all their tricks they never attacked the laws of nature. In vain might they order the thunder to hush, or the winds to abate, or the lightnings to cease their flashing. Again, I saw this man while we were passing from Jericho. There was a blind man who cried out to him for mercy, and Jesus said to me, Go, bring him near. And when we brought him near, Jesus asked him what he wanted. He said he wanted to see him. Jesus said, Receive thy sight. When he was not near enough for Jesus to lay his hands upon him or use any art. Thus were all his miracles performed. He did not act as the Egyptian necromancers. They used vessels such as cups, bags, and jugs, and many other things to deceive. Jesus used nothing but his simple speech in such a way that all could understand him, and it seemed as if the laws of nature were his main instruments of action, and that nature was as obedient to him as a slave is to his master. I recall another occasion when a young man was dead, and Jesus loved his sisters. One of them went with Jesus to the tomb. He commanded it to be uncovered. The sister said, Master, by this time he is offensive. He has been dead four days. Jesus said, Only have faith. And he called the young man by name, and he came forth out of the tomb, and is living today. And Peter proposed that I should see him for myself. Thus argue Peter and John. If Jesus had such power over nature and nature's laws and power over death in others, he would have such power over death that he could lay down his life and take it up again, as he said he would. As he proposes to bring hundreds of witnesses to prove all he says, and much more, witnesses whose veracity cannot be doubted, and as I had heard many of these things before from different men, both friends and foes, and although these things are related by his friends, that is, the friends of Jesus, yet these men talk like men of truth, and their testimonies corroborates other evidence that I have from other sources that convinces me that this is something that should not be rationally dealt with. And seeing the humble trust and confidence of this man and woman, besides, as John says, thousands of others equally strong in their belief, it throws me into great agitation. I feel some dreadful foreboding, a weight upon my heart. I cannot feel as a criminal from the fact that I was acting according to my best judgment with the evidence before me. I feel that I was acting in defense of God and my country, which I love better than my life. And if I was mistaken, 
I was honest in my mistake. And this we teach, that honesty of purpose gives character to the action. On this basis I shall try to clear myself of any charge, yet there is a conscious fear about my heart, so that I have no rest day or night. I feel sure that if I should meet Jesus, I would fall dead at his feet. And it seemed to me, if I went out, I should be sure to meet him. In this state of conscious dread, I remained investigating the scriptures to know more about the prophecies concerning this man, but found nothing to satisfy my mind. I locked my doors and gave the guards orders to let no one in without first giving me notice. While thus engaged, with no one in the room but my wife and Annas, her father, when I lifted up my eyes, behold, Jesus of Nazareth stood before me. My breath stopped, my blood ran cold, and I was in the act of falling when he spoke and said, Be not afraid, it is I. You condemn me that you might go free. This is the work of my father. Your only wrong is you have a wicked heart. This you must repent of. This last lamb you have slain is the one that was appointed before the foundation. This sacrifice is made for all men. Your other lambs were for those who offered them. This is for all. This is the last. It is for you if you will accept it. I died that you and all mankind might be saved. At this, he looked at me with such melting tenderness that it seemed to me I was nothing but tears and my strength was all gone. I fell on my face at his feet as one that was dead. When Aras lifted me up, Jesus was gone and the door still locked. No one could tell when or where he went. So, noble masters, I do not feel that I can officiate as priest anymore. If this strange personage is from God and should prove to be the Savior we have looked for so long, and I have been the means of crucifying him, I have no further offerings to make for sin. But I will wait and see how these things will develop. And if he proves to be the ruler that we are looking for, they will soon develop into something more grand in the future. His glory will increase. His influence will spread wider and wider until the whole earth will be full of his glory and all the kingdoms of the world shall be his dominion. Such are the teachings of the prophets on this subject. Therefore, you will appoint Jonathan or someone to fill the holy place. We found that soon after, Jonathan became high priest, though history teaches us differently. Megan.